It's now time for members' statements. Member for Windsor, Tecumseh. Speaker, I wish to pay tribute today to Tom Kilpatrick. Tom just retired after 40 years as a public school board trustee in Windsor. 40 years, Speaker. He was just 35 years old when he was first elected. That was back in 1978. The Prime Minister was Pierre Elliott Trudeau. The Premier was Bill Davis, and Windsor's Mayor was Bert Weeks. Those were the days, Speaker, when school board trustees had the power to levy taxes. They had total control over the budgets and programs. They did all the hiring. They did their own bargaining with their employee groups. Yes, much has changed in education over the past 40 years, Speaker. Tom Kilpatrick served several terms as chair of the public board over those many years. His was a voice of reason, a quiet man of influence, whose educated opinion was highly valued. Tom spent most of his working life at St. Clair College as the coordinator of the Economics and Management Department. He chose not to seek re-election this time, although he would have won easily had he decided to stay on. After 40 years as a trustee, they give you a gold pin with a diamond star, but Tom Kilpatrick gave his public school system much more than that. Thousands of volunteer hours, he was a role model and mentor to newer trustees and someone administration could always go to for ideas and solutions. Speaker Tom Kilpatrick was one in a million. The Greater Essex County Public School Board will miss his leadership, and I wish him well and a long and healthy retirement. Very good. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Bruce Gray Owens. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Most of the members are familiar with Ontario agriculture, but how many have heard of Ontario aquaculture? And what if I told you that over 100 million meals of farmed Ontario seafood were served this year across Ontario and in the United States? That's 100 million meals of Ontario farmed rainbow trout, Ontario shrimp, Ontario tilapia, and Ontario lake whitefish that have been grown by farmers here in our great province. So today I'm excited to welcome several fish farmers to Queen's Park, including R.J. Taylor, who is my constituent and owner, along with his sister Arlen, of Cedar Crest Trout Farms, one of the largest commercial trout hatcheries around. Their parents, Jim and Lynette, were pioneers in the industry, and next year will celebrate their 50th anniversary raising farm fish. They're here today to talk about the sector's incredible growth potential, and I'd be remiss if I did not thank the Ministers of Environment, Natural Resources and Agriculture for making themselves available to discuss new job creation opportunities in this fast-growing sector. Last year in Ontario waters, farmers grew 15 million pounds of seafood and created more than 550 well-paying jobs, often in rural communities. Speaker, members with, a small and members with a small amount of red tape reduction and some regulatory changes to recognize the current realities of the industry, this sector could soar. And it could soar in a way that protects our precious water resources in Ontario. It could grow more fish and shrimp than ever before. It could bring jobs and industry to our province while increasing our export potential. Why is this important to me? Well, if you've collected my trading cards yet, I can't use them as a prop, Mr. Speaker, you already know the answer. The majority of farmed rainbow trout is born in my home riding, with seven commercial hatcheries that supply most of the young trout that grow in the sustainable net pen farms in Georgian Bay, and specifically in the backyard of my colleague from Algoma, Manitoulin, MPP Mantha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to invite our guests again here today and not steal Mr. York's uh, friend from uh, St. Thomas. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Humber River, Black Creek. London North Centre. I apologize. London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Over the last week, I've heard from numerous organizations in my riding of London North Centre who condemn this government's decision to scrap the expert panel on violence against women. We know that misogyny is one of the leading causes of violence in this province, and yet this government continues to roll back support for abused women. Aside from cancelling the roundtable, the government has refused to honour funding increases for Ontario's sexual assault centres. It has removed a health and phys ed curriculum that focuses on online safety, respect and consent. And now, we learn that the government's attack on Bill 148 threatens to axe a working woman's right to receive paid leave if she is the victim of domestic or sexual violence. Just this last week, I was proud to attend the media launch of the ninth annual Shine the Light campaign in London North Centre. The campaign, organized by Megan Walker, the executive director of London Abuse Women's Centre, aims to educate Londoners about men's violence against women. For years, Megan has been a powerful, respected, and outspoken advocate for women's rights. She is a force of nature. 
During the month of November, London will turn purple to stand in solidarity with abused women. This year's campaign will shine a light on women who have died from male violence as well as survivors of revenge porn. Sharing intimate photos or videos without consent is sexual violence, and this message is critically important in fostering a culture of consent online. I applaud the work of Shine the Light campaign and stand in solidarity with their efforts to end violence against women. Thank you. Thank you, the member for Durham. The speaker, I rise. to recognize the third annual Access to Justice Week. As parliamentary assistant to the Attorney General, I'm honoured to stand in this legislature to help bring attention to this important issue. What is access to justice? As a starting point, it refers to the formal rights recognized by our Constitution, to be informed of charges against you in criminal and penal matters in a timely way, to be tried in a reasonable time, and to receive a fair and public hearing by an independent and impartial decision maker. However, many would agree that real access to justice, real justice for the people, is beyond just the courtroom, and there is much important work to be done. I want to applaud the Law Society of Ontario and their partners for spurring a constructive dialogue on this pressing issue through the Action Group on Access to Justice and the sessions going on this week. Many people in Ontario still have difficulty accessing affordable legal services when they need them most. They also face seemingly endless court appearances and wait times to bring a conclusion to a legal dispute. The first step in moving forward is understanding the issues we're currently faced with and then creating solutions to address them. Access to Justice Week is a valuable, innovative effort to do just that. Thank you, Speaker. The member of St. Catharines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to share with you a story of a mother named Colleen from my community. Colleen's son, Darrell, passed away in March 2015 after a long struggle with mental illness. Throughout his life, Darrell was placed in six different long-term care facilities and admitted to the hospital 56 times for mental health episodes. Colleen's struggle did not end there as she was diagnosed with PTSD as a result of her son's constant battle with mental illness. While Colleen understands that the hospitals are often overworked and underfunded, watching her son be discharged time in and time again from the Niagara Health System did nothing to ease her pain. Unfortunately, Daryl fell through the cracks. Colleen's story is one of the countless others I heard this past Saturday at a community forum for mental health in Niagara. Mental health services are currently handled by at least 10 different ministries, hundreds upon hundreds of different service organizations. Mr. Speaker, it is time for this government to create a dedicated ministry, ministry for health and addictions so that no one has to watch a family member fall through the cracks ever again. People are crying out for help. Families and friends who have lost loved ones are crying out for help. I sincerely hope that the minister will sit down with myself and local health experts to find a comprehensive solution to mental health crisis that is going on right now in St. Catharines. Member statements. The member for Barry Springwater Oral Madonte. This government is not only our role to fix policies and, and create legislation. I believe it's also our role to give pause and to remember why and how we get to be here. To give thanks for the opportunity all of us have that allows us to live here in this province during this time of peace, almost 620,000 Canadians enlisted during World War I. 61,000 never came home, and another 172,000 were wounded. I'm grateful to be able to share with this House that November 11, 2018, will be the 100th anniversary of the signing of the armistice that officially ended World War I. A hundred years ago, bells rang out everywhere, an auditory symbol of peace. But members, the Royal Canadian Legion of Veterans Affairs Canada needs your help. They need your help carrying the torch of remembrance through a special event, the Bells of Peace Initiative. Well, this is a member statement. It comes with an ask. I request all members of this House promote the Bells of Peace Initiative in your respective writings and on your websites and social media. 
Legion branches and other groups across the province are in need of assistance. They need help ringing the bells of peace, the remembrance event, and making it a success. In honour of all those families who received the call of duty those many years ago, I ask all members of this House to reach out themselves to Legion's faith communities and other groups and do what they can to celebrate the bells of peace. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. I rise today to raise two education issues that are, that are important to my constituents of Parkdale High Park. We all know our schools are crumbling and the disrepair backlog stands at $16 billion. So what is this government doing about it? Nothing. Let me tell you what doing nothing looks like on the ground for our kids. Last week, students at an elementary school in my riding, St. Vincent de Paul, had to go three days without heat because the boiler broke down. Parents had to bring heaters into the classrooms because the kids were freezing and were bundled in coats and scarves. Not everyone got a heater because it was going to overburden the electrical circuit of the school. And this is in October. What's going to happen when the boiler breaks down again in the dead of winter? Also, I received a letter from the student school in my riding, which was also sent to Premier Ford and the Minister of Education, condemning the cancellation of the 2015 sex ed curriculum and the creation of the snitch line. They asked this government to put the interest and safety of students first. I hope that the minister includes this as part of her consultation that she's conducting right now. Speaker, when it comes to education, it is clear that this conservative government is putting the needs of students last, mm -hmm. and that is wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member for Markham Unionville. Mr. Speaker, last weekend in my riding, I had the privilege in attending a first showing of a documentary entitled My Hometown Across the Ocean. The documentary highlighted the historical relationship between Canada and China. During the early 1900s, Canadians traveled to the Xichin province in China and helped the local communities through providing health care to community members along with training in medical practices and also engaged in building schools. Many Canadians grew up in this province in China and some of them were even present at that event which I had the pleasure in meeting and exchanging remarks regarding their experience. Mr. Speaker, this opportunity to learn about Canadian involvement in China reminds me that the importance of positive collaboration between nations and how, through helping each other, we make each other stronger. I'm honored and proud to be a part of a nation like Canada, which has engaged in a commendable diplomatic engagements with other countries and serves as a modern-day example of a peacekeeping nation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Member Statements. The member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Euroworks uh, Precision is a small, innovative Mississauga homegrown business owned and operated by Dan Pavlovic. A few years ago, seeing the sharp increase in his water bill, Dan designed a device that would cut his water costs significantly. He designed and manufactured his product right here in Ontario. But Dan faced a lot of red tape in almost every aspect of his business. His dedication and commitment to his product as well as his dream kept him going. He found challenges in sourcing skilled labor in Ontario and his product in a timely fashion and a number of other issues. Consequently, he moved a large portion of his business to the United States. Oh, Canada is known as the place where new and innovative ideas are produced like dance. But we cannot nurture those ideas, Mr. Speaker, and companies like Euroworks go abroad. 
Then is one of many cases where innovative new technology and research is produced in Ontario, but to success, they need to go elsewhere. We, the government, for the people, are working hard to make sure people like Dan can be successful in Ontario. Thank you. Well said. That concludes our time for member statements. Reports by committees. I recognize the member for Lanark from.